Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Brand of Cain by Hugh B. Cave Part 1 Waterlogged Corpse Mr. Michael Aloysius Kelly, night watchman on board the steamship Concord, took a corncob pipe out of his face and stretched himself. Being alone on board the half-submerged hulk of a wrecked steamship did not annoy him so much as did the endless yammering of rain around and about him. Rain mutter had been disturbing the Kelly eardrums for hours. He peered around the ship's dining room, spat smoke from his wrinkled lips, and slouched erect. It was not easy to walk up without staggering. For one thing, though the Concord had been aground since yesterday noon, the distance between ship and shore was alarmingly great, and the moiled waters in which the Concord now rolled were apparently suffering a severe hangover from the storm which had aroused them. The Concord, after crashing head-on into the side of a Tampico-bound freighter, had shivered herself loose, wallowed helplessly, through more than a mile of mountainous seas and finally bogged down in shallow water offshore. And though the ship still lay in a reasonably upright position, the carpet beneath Mr. Kelly's feet was damp, and the floor pitched and swayed disturbingly as he made his way into the ship's salon. From adjoining staterooms came sounds of seawater sloshing sluggishly against walls and bunks. Mr. Kelly swayed to a slow stop, stood listening, and puffed his red face into a scowl. He was hearing things. The sound that disturbed him was a dull thumping noise that accompanied the gurgling of seawater in a nearby stateroom. He opened the stateroom door and thumbed the light switch. When the switch failed to function, he unhooked an enormous searchlight from his belt and used that. The glare of the searchlight showed him an inundated oblong of floor, a stool, a wash basin, and a double bunk. Mr. Kelly stared at the floor. He took a step backward and opened his eyes to white rim bigness. Breath rattled in his throat. The hand that gripped the flashlight began to tremble. The thing on the floor was not pretty to look at. Its feet were somehow wedged beneath the bunk, and from the looks of things the rest of it had been wedged there also, until dislodged by the ship's continued lurching. It had been dead a long while. Its face was white and bloated, its mouth hung open, and its wide eyes peered glassily into Mr. Kelly's own. With every sluggish roll of the ship, the body lurched as though alive, its pajama-clad torso wallowing in dirty water, its head thumping the base of the washstand in rhythm. Mr. Kelly backed away from it and quickly pushed the door shut. His heart was pounding furiously. His legs were limp with terror as he hastened back to the dining room. On a sideboard in the dining room, the police had installed a telephone. Michael Aloysius Kelly seized the instrument in trembling fingers and called police headquarters. Peter Kane, ace Seamus of the Beacon Agency, sat in the back room booth at Limpy's on Stewart Street and stared moodily at a dark square bottle of scotch on the table before him. The bottle was half empty. An hour ago, it had been full. Life, Kane reflected, was very good. With a bottle of scotch on hand and nothing to disturb a man's drinking time, life could be very pleasant indeed. Limpy, proprietor of the establishment, waddled into the back room and tapped Kane's shoulder. Listen, Kane, Limpy said. Joe Henderson is out front looking for you. Will I tell him where you are? Joe Henderson was a fellow slave on the Beacon payroll. His presence was ominous. Kane sighed, tamped out a half-smoked cigarette, and realized that life was no longer pleasant. Henderson peered searchingly into the cane countenance. He sat down, pushed a square bottle out of the way. You're assigned to the Concord job, Kane, he grinned. The police, Kane said, are all ready. This is private. The steamship company just called up the office and hired Peter Kane. It seems a dead guy was found on board the wreck last night, after they thought all the bodies had been removed. It also seems the dead guy is a company official. 
so you're hired to look into things. It must be they think you're good. Henderson helped himself to a drink. Me, personally, I think you're a hollow-legged souse with a taste for a lousy brand of liquor. He grinned. Have a good time, pal. They tell me Moroni is doing the snooping for the police. I feel for you, Kane. I feel for you. Life for Kane has suddenly become very lousy. He groaned. It was not enough that the peaceful routine of his drunken existence was about to be disturbed. On top of that, the job was one that would necessitate close contact with a lot of phileous looking green ocean. Sure as hell, Kane mumbled. How could seasick? Feel sick already. He was more than sick when he climbed out of his own coop a couple of hours later and hiked across a broken down wharf that fronted on a bulging, heavy expanse of that same despised ocean. The Concord had gone aground off Sanders Cove, and Sanders Cove had apparently been used from time immemorial as a dumping ground for clamshells, the ceased fish, and sea spawned refuse that stunk to high heaven. The odors assailed Kane's innards as he paraded forward. His face had taken on a hue that matched the pale muddy green of his battered hat. The mingled stenches of things dead and decaying did not harmonize with the quantities of liquor already reposing in the Kane's stomach. I'm going to hate this job, Kane groaned. He went toward an end of the wharf where a large individual in hip boots and dirty clothes was messing about on board a fishing boat. The fellow looked up and blinked watery eyes. Take you out around the wreck for a dollar, mister, the fellow said. Kane stepped aboard. Take me to it, not around it, Kane groaned. And for God's sake, avoid the bumps. Water, especially a whole lot of it, like this, always does things to me. He had a ghastly upside-down feeling in the pit of his stomach when the fishing boat finally chugged alongside the Concord. Resolutely, he climbed the ladder that hung over the steamer's side. The broad grin on the fisherman's leathery face did not bother him. He was beyond being bothered by trivialities. Kane said, Stick around, guy, and steered a crooked course along the Concord's deck. Opening a door, he marched through a narrow passageway and went down a flight of stairs into the salon. Moroni and another dick from headquarters were talking near the newsstand and turned to eye Kane as he approached. A scowl hooked Moroni's large face and the scowl became a broad grin. Well... Look what's here, he beamed, the great Peter Kane himself, in person. You don't look so good this morning, Kane. You sick? Kane stared at the bulge of Moroni's big stomach. He thought dully that if Mr. Moroni's large belly were as full of sickness as Peter Kane's little one was, Mr. Moroni would be a very sick man indeed, and that would be swell. Lowering himself onto the divan, he pulled a pint bottle of whiskey from his pocket and had a long drink. On a job like this, with largemouth baroni and a lot of heaving green ocean all over the place, the only thing to do was get thoroughly plastered and remain that way. Baroni said, Sorry, Kane, but you got to clear out. We're under orders from the steamship company to bar anyone who don't have official business or a permit. The trouble is, Kane groaned, the steamship company hired me, so I got to stay. Wearily helped himself to a long look around the salon. The place had several occupants. On the other side of the room sat a dumpy, red-faced man who had a corncob pipe stuck in his face and was slouched down in a big leather chair, intently watching everyone else but saying nothing. Most likely the fellow was Mr. Michael Aloysius Kelly, who, according to the papers, had discovered the body last night. Mr. Kelly seemed particularly interested in a woman who, at the moment of Kane's arrival, had been opening and closing stateroom doors, but who was now standing very still and straight at the foot of the staircase. She was a small woman with dirty gray hair and a woodenish body that had no curves. Her face was gray, and one side of it kept twitching. She had small dark eyes that drilled holes in Cain's soul and made him feel itchy all over. From the looks of things, the woman was either going to throw a fit or fall into a nervous collapse. Upstairs, a couple of men, who looked like insurance sticks, were nosing around and yelling back and forth to each other. Whereabouts, Kane demanded, is the body? The body was on a bunk in the stateroom where Michael Kelly had reputedly discovered it. Kane prowled forward, pushed open the stateroom door. With Moroni trailing him, he entered and took a long look around, bent over the body and stared down into a white, unlovely face that was very dead. The dame out there, Moroni said, is this guy's wife. 
that she's positive he was a passenger on the boat, was traveling under an assumed name because he had some other dame in tow. The way she prowls around here, snooping into this and that, would give anybody the living creeps. Kane said, who is this guy? The name is Mr. Clarence Waite, with an E. He's a big shot with a steamship company. Kane braced himself against the hulk and made a careful inspection, had to forcibly hold down the contents of the Kane's stomach while he turned the body over and examined it. It was bad enough to be drunk and seasick both, but having to mess around with a pajama-clad body which was bloated with seawater and had already begun to decompose. You won't find anything, Moroni shrugged. The guy was drowned. Chances are he tried to get out of bed when the crash came and got himself jammed under the bunk. That's why the body wasn't discovered until later, when the roll of the ship dislodged it. Cain felt the need of another long drink from the bottle in his pocket. He had one. This guy's name on the passenger list, he demanded. I guess you don't read the papers, Moroni said. They didn't have no passenger list. The purser's office downstairs was wiped out in the crash, and thanks to a lot of official dumbness, there wasn't a duplicate list on shore. Cain made a rumbling noise in his throat. On his way out of the stateroom, he again peered at the woman who stood near the staircase. If she was the wife of Mr. Clarence Waite, she probably knew things that might be of importance. He started toward her, changed his mind and stopped. Someone else, coming down the stairs, was apparently bent on engaging the woman in conversation. Kane put a cigarette in his mouth, walked unobtrusively to Devon and sat down. A scowl twisted the corner of his mouth that was not filled with cigarette. He wondered what Dr. Nicholas Ackerman was doing on board the Concorde. Ackerman, tagged with a shady reputation was extended far back into the past, was supposedly the head of a private hospital in Plymouth. The man towered above Mrs. Clarence Waite, had a hand on the woman's elbow as he talked to her in low tones that failed to reach Kane's ears. He had a string bean body and stooped shoulders and an angular dark-skinned face that would have harmonized nicely and probably did with operating rooms and the midnight moans of patients. When he was through talking, he gently patted the woman's arm, shook his head to a toss-up mop of black hair away from his high forehead, and walked away. Kane watched him. The man nodded to Moroni, peered darkly in Kane's direction, and strode along the passageway that led to the dining room. Kane stood up, blew cigarette smoke through quivering nostrils. He had met Dr. Nicholas Ackerman before, had in fact been assigned to investigate certain shady dealings in which Ackerman had been involved. The presence of Ackerman aboard the Concorde was something to think about. Moroni had evidently thought about it. That guy, Moroni said, gives me the creeps, Kane. How he got a permit to snoop around here, I wouldn't know. He says he's one of the crash victims, was a staff member at his hospital. But if that's an excuse for him to go prowling around like a walking corpse. Kane had the neck of a pint bottle in his throat and was gurgling noisily. He gagged, spat a spray of whiskey at the floor, muttered darkly. With guys like him hanging around and a waterlogged corpse to mess over and a floor that won't keep still under a man's feet, this is one lousy job. He paced forward, pawed the wall in an effort to keep the cane torso on an even keel. Then because someone called him by name, he dragged his unsteady feet to a stop and turn. The young man who came toward him had for the past half hour been sitting at the desk in the salon, methodically filling pages of paper with what was probably an official report. He was a slender, good-looking, and had a lick of black hair curling gracefully over one temple. He said, You're Detective Kane, aren't you? I was, Kane growled, before I came aboard this damn barge. The young man did not smile. His gray eyes scrutinized Kane from head to foot. I'm Frank Deasy, he said. The company sent me down to make an estimate of financial loss. If there's anything I can do. You work for Coastal Steamship? The young man nodded. Mr. Way, he said, with a movement of his head toward the door of the stateroom, where Clarence Waite lay sprawled on the death bunk, was my superior. Kane exhaled slowly, put a hand on the young man's arm and steered him to Devon. If the corpse cargo of this wreck barge had formerly been Mr. Deasy's superior, it was just probable that Mr. Deasy might be able to furnish pertinent information. Mr. Deasy could and did. It's probably true, he said, sitting with his knees apart and his gaze focused on the floor that Mr. Waite was on the passenger list under an assumed name. He glanced at Kane quickly and put a hand out to touch Kane's arm. Understand, I have no proof. I only know that Waite took frequent trips to New York 
whenever home conditions got too stiff for him. Usually, he took along a companion. Kay nodded, glanced across the room to where Clarence Waite's wife had been standing at the foot of the staircase. The woman was no longer there. Evidently, she had quietly gone upstairs. So you think Waite was a passenger? Kay murmured. Yes, I do. Frank D.C. blew ashes from the glowing tip of a cigarette and screwed his good-looking face into a scowl. In the first place, he'd been working hard at the office, preparing the semi-annual financial report for the auditors. It was at times like that that he usually helped himself to impromptu vacations and slipped away without saying a word to any of us. D.C. stood up. If I can help you in any way, let me know. Right now I've got to get back to the office. Kane sat there for ten minutes with his legs stuck out in front of him and his gaze focused on his shoes. The cane brain was at last beginning to function, probably because of the increased amount of liquor in the cane's stomach. In the beginning, this thing had looked like a case for an undertaker, not for a private Seamus, who disliked messing about in surroundings where people got seasick. Yet the coastal steamship company had hired Peter Kane to investigate the discovery of Clarence Waite's body. That meant that the officials of coastal steamship were inclined to disagree with the theory that Clarence White had been a passenger. Perhaps, after all, Mr. Clarence Waite had not been a passenger. Kane pushed himself erect and found Moroni, he said. Has the medical examiner seen Waite yet? The Moroni countenance wigwagged sideways. Not yet. We're taking the remains with us when we get through here. In a chair beside Moroni sat the chalk-faced form of Mr. Michael Aloysius Kelly. Mr. Kelly was obviously frightened. From the looks of things, Moroni had been doing a great deal of involved thinking and had arrived at the conclusion that Mr. Kelly would bear questioning. Having decided upon that, Moroni had apparently, in the usual Moroni manner, taken Michael Aloysius Kelly apart to see what made him tick. Mr. Kelly looked very ill. Kane glanced into Kelly's grave face, sighed, and took himself away from there. The pint bottle in his pocket was empty and the sickness in his own stomach was insidiously creeping higher. He took himself out on deck. A grunt of relief gurgled in his throat when he saw the guardian of the fishing boat had obeyed orders and hung around. Part 2. A Shadowy Assassin It was 2 p.m. when the cane chariot rode to a stop on Atlantic Avenue in Boston in front of the building occupied by Coastal Steamship Lines, Inc. Kane had used up the best part of two hours in driving back from Sanders Cove had stopped twice en route, parked himself in drinking establishments, and consumed large quantities of liquor in a vain attempt to rid his mind of the ghastly, unshakable vision of a green ocean that clung there. Nothing but a prolonged diet of good scotch whiskey would ever budge that ghastly vision and return the cane innards to normal. He got out of the car and steered a crooked course up the steps of the buildings before him. Instinct warned him to avoid such stomach-lifting vehicles as elevators, so he used the stairs. For half an hour, he sat in conference with the officials of Coastal Steamship and acquired information concerning the past history and habits of Mr. Clarence Waite. The information checked quite nicely with that which had already been volunteered by Mr. Waite's underling, the athletic young man whose name was Frank D.C. Waite had made frequent trips to New York on the quiet, Undoubtedly, his very angry and very nagging wife had known a great deal about it, and it was unfortunate that Waite had seen fit to return from his last New York visit as an incognito passenger on board the ill-fated Concord. Most unfortunate, it meant that the company's financial report would now be unavoidably held up and would have to be completed by Waite's understudy. How come you're so positive, Kane demanded, that Waite traveled under an assumed name? I thought the passenger list was lost. Yes, yes, the passenger list had been lost. But the person whose duty it was to see that all passengers were duly listed was a man who had a good memory. He was positive that no such name as Clarence Waite had appeared on the list. So you see, Mr. Kane, murmured one smirking gentleman who apparently did the most of Coastal's hiring and firing. We were really on the wrong track when we requested your services. There's nothing now to investigate. We really don't need you after all. I'm sorry. A sigh of relief whispered on Kane's whiskey sweet breath. That, he murmured, is a break. You don't have any idea. He felt so good that he took the elevator on the way down. That was a mistake, said a drop of the elevator car 
pushed the contents of the cane's stomach into the cane throat and brought a weird whiteness to his face. When he got into his car, he sat very still for ten long minutes, while the heaving sensation in his midsection subsided to normal. Then he drove to Limpy's on Stewart Street. It was 6 p.m. when Joe Henderson, fellow slave on the Beacon Agency payroll, again found him in Limpy's back room. The quart bottle on Kane's table was two-thirds empty. Kane was plastered. A grin was on Henderson's large face. He sat down, murmured gently, I hear you got relieved of that steamship job. That made you mad, huh? Kane had a silver cigarette case in one hand and a pony of scotch in the other. About 15 minutes ago, Henderson went on, the coastal steamship outfit called the office and re-engaged the services of a guy by the name of Peter Kane. It seems the medical examiner found some interesting stuff in the stomach of Mr. Clarence Waite. Poison, in fact. And so the whole thing looks very dark and dirty all of a sudden, and your vacation is over. Kane stared, made rumbling noises in his throat. A look of pain came into his countenance. It's a cruel world, he says solemnly. The boss, said Henderson, told me to tell you to hide yourself down there to the wreck and get on the job before you get plastered or something. He figures you'll stay sober down there. Darkness had blurred the greenish-gray hue of the Atlantic when Kane got out of his car in Sanders Cove and paced sluggishly across the wharf. A light glowed in the window of the wharf shanty. At Kane's drunken hello, the guardian of the fishing boat emerged from the shack's doorway. There ain't a living soul on board except Kelly the watchman, the fellow informed Kane, while guiding his chug-chug boat, the restless waters that disturbed the cane intestines. Mr. Baroni, he told me not to take no one out there tonight, unless they got a written permit. But I guess you're all right, seeing as how you're a detective. Kane was silent. His mouth was clamped shut, and he kept it that way for reasons best known to Peter Kane. When he had climbed the ladder and gained the Concord's deck, he closed his eyes and hung onto the rail. The chug-chug man called up to him. You want me to wait? Kane shook his head, opened his mouth, and, and said, Come back in a couple of hours. Very quickly, and closed his mouth again. Then he pawed his way along the deck and descended into the steamer's bowels. A ship's lantern was burning in the salon, and Kelly, the night watchman, came scuffing from the dining room, staring with big eyes and gripping an enormous searchlight and one outthrust fist. Oh, it's you, Kelly mumbled. I was wondering who in the name of God at this time of night. He shuddered, peered fearfully around. This job is enough to give a man the holy shakes, Mr. Kane. Kane said, You all alone? I I think so. But sometimes I ain't so sure. I'll be sitting here, reading out of a magazine or something, and I hear the strangest noises. Kane walked crookedly to a chair and sat down. He had come here to do things, to look around and make his own kind of investigation without the interference of Moroni and others who might veto the cane method of research. The lantern swung slowly back and forth. Mouse-shaped shadows, created by its yellow glare, did the same thing. Kane's innards followed suit. A groan of misery spilled from Kane's lips. Then very suddenly, he stared straight ahead. His hands tightened on the arms of the chair he was sitting in, and his big body stiffened. His eyes widened, refused to blink. At the head of the stairs, some twenty paces distant, stood a dark, ill-defined shape that did not belong there. The shape was grotesquely tall in actuality and looked gigantic because of the shadows that enveloped it. It had two glowing eyes that returned Kane's stare. For twenty seconds, Kane's blood ran cold with creeping dread of things sinister and supernatural. Then the menacing monster moved. It descended the stair slowly and paced forward into the glow of the lantern. Kane relaxed, dragged breath into his numb lungs, and pushed himself erect scowling. His left hand slid into a pocket of his coat. Good evening, Mr. Kane, the shape said. Kane growled, Is it? and stood wide legged glaring. The presence of Dr. Nicholas Ackerman on board the Concord had been ominous before. During daylight hours, it was doubly so now. The man's thin lipped smile was ominous too, and the osher glow of the lantern. His shadowed face possessed a corpse pallor. The man had stopped within five feet of Cain and was standing motionless, smiling as though fully aware of Cain's uneasiness. He stiffened slightly as Cain jerked toward him. Cain said grimly, All right, Ackerman, what's the big idea? The man's eyebrows and shoulders 
went up in unison. I do not understand what you mean. You're here, aren't you? What for? I have a permit. The permit's no good at night, and you know it. How'd you get bored? Again, that ominous half-smile curled Ackerman's mouth. Is it really quite simple, Mr. Kane? I hired a man to bring me here in a rowboat. Where is he now? Ackerman calmly raised one arm and peered at a strap watch. By now he should have returned. I told him to come back in an hour. Really, Mr. Kane, my motive for coming here tonight was quite reasonable. I'm neither a vampire, as you seem to think, nor a thief in the dark. I came here to take pictures. To what? To take pictures. Quietly, Ackerman displayed a small but expensive camera, rolls of films, flash sheet equipment. This morning, while I was here to check on the unfortunate death of one of my assistants, who was a passenger, I was deeply impressed by the macabre atmosphere of the ship. Photography is my hobby, Mr. Kane, especially the photographing of things weird and unusual. So I took the liberty of returning here tonight. Kane's eyes narrowed, clouded with suspicion, but the vague smile did not fade from Ackerman's thin lips. With a shrug, the doctor stepped backward. Now, if you're quite reassured, Mr. Kane, I had better perhaps be leaving. Kane watched him go, felt damp and clammy all over. He returned slowly to his chair and helped himself to a long, stiff drink from the cork container where he had brought with him. He needed it. The evil stare of Ackerman's eyes had eaten right through to the cane arteries and soured the blood that coursed there. His gaze focused again on the ship's lantern. The lantern was still swaying horribly to and fro, and the floor of the salon was doing the same thing. King groaned, closed his eyes, and gulped hard. But closing his eyes did not help. Peter Kane, a stick of the Beacon Agency, was a sick Seamus. Nothing less than a team of mules could have dragged him out of the chair he was sitting in. He wanted very much to die and get it over with. Instead, he spent the next half hour guzzling from the quart bottle, and for the first time in his eventful life he passed out before the supply of liquor was finished. The strap watch on his wrist said 4.20 a.m. when he came to, but he did not know it. His gluey eyes jerked open, focused groggily on the swaying lanterns. His mouth was full of whiskey, thick tongue, and his big body was piled like a deflated blimp in the chair. He groaned, hauled himself to a more upright position, and the sound which had aroused him from his drunken stupor came again, whispering its way into his consciousness. He hunched forward, stared. From passageway upstairs and gloom beyond the head of the staircase came a sound of slow footsteps. Browning Kane pushed himself to his feet and swayed forward. He was seasick and suffering from a monstrous hangover, but he managed somehow to keep on an even keel as he swayed across the salon floor. Sometimes, despite its usual load of Limpy's bad liquor, or perhaps because of that, the Kane brain functioned clearly when other brains might be expected to wallow in darkness. Right now, the Kane brain was full of a disturbing intuition that something was very wrong. The gloom around him was alive with strange noises that might be considered normal on board a wrecked hulk which lay at the mercy of heaving seas. But that other sound, that sluggish whisper of footsteps in the passage above, was somehow ominous. Kane pawed the banister, ascended slowly. Hangover hammers pounded a dull dirge inside his skull and his throat was gummy with a fusel oil and Limby's liquor. When he reached the head of the stairs, he stopped, dragged breath into his lungs, and gathered himself together. The sound of footsteps had ceased. Cain moved slowly into gloom, tiptoed along a corridor where stateroom doors frowned darkly on both sides. Ahead of him, a sliver of light crept from beneath a closed portal and yellowed the floor. In a dozen slow strides, Cain reached the door, thrust a hand toward the knob, from inside came sounds of a bunk creaking. The light was suddenly extinguished. The stateroom door flung open in Peter Kane's face. The liquor in Kane's big body went to his legs as he lunged sideways to avoid the pile driver fist that lashed out at him. His shoulder crashed the side of the door frame. The impact spun him off balance, left him wide open. The fist raked one side of his face. It was a hard fist full of knuckles. The blow jarred Kane's head on his shoulder and drew blood. It would have knocked a sober man out. Instead of doing that to Kane, it shook some of the whiskey mist from his eyes and brought a savage snarl from his bleeding lips. He staggered forward, cursed the darkness that blinded him to the flailing arms that sought to drive him back. One thing he was sure of, 
He was fighting a man who knew how to fight. An upthrust knee ground into the pit of his stomach. When he stumbled back, gasping, his assailant rushed him with lowered head, both fists working like pistons. One of those fists held something big solid, probably the searchlight, whose glow had lured Kane along the corridor. The weapon crashed down on Kane's head, crashed again and again as he got his arms around the killer's body and tried to drag the man down. It found a vital spot. Blood trickled from Kane's gasping mouth. He stumbled, clawed the wall as he collapsed. The killer lurched away from him, turned, wrenched open a shuttered window that gave access to the catwalk outside. For an instant, Kane's eyes, blurred by the blood, focused on a contorted shape that clamored through the aperture. The shape thudded loudly on the deck outside, made more noise as it clambered onto the ship's rails. Through the shuttered window, Kane caught a dim vision of something big and dark leaping out into space. A muffled splash echoed up from the sea below. Kane didn't hear the splash. He was smothered by the groans that issued from his own battered mouth as he crawled on hands and knees into the corridor. He clung hard to consciousness, refusing to pass out. At the end of the passage, he clutched the banister at the stairhead and hauled himself erect. Kelly, he croaked hoarsely. Kelly. Then he collapsed, and a gurgling contortion had slid grotesquely down the carpeted stairs to land in a sprawled heap on the floor below. Part 3. Call for Kane. A sidewalk clock on Huntington Avenue said 4.30 p.m. when Kane hiked out of the Peter Bent Brigham and thumbed the passing cab. Getting out of the hospital had not been as easy as getting into it. He had known nothing whatever about getting in. Michael Aloysius Kelly and a Sanders Cove doctor had driven him to the city in his own car after Kelly and the pilot of the fishing boat had lugged him ashore. When consciousness had finally filtered through the blood mist in Kane's brain, his blurred gaze had focused in bewilderment on the hovering face of a hospital doctor and the white walls of an accident ward. Getting out of the place had necessitated a lot of loud talk, threats, and the signing of certain papers which relieved the hospital of all responsibility for what might happen after the exodus. Kane said grimly to the cab driver, I got a car parked in the Huntington garage, or so they tell me. Drive over there. It was after six when he reached Sanders Cove. The ocean was a monstrous caterpillar that crawled away into gathering gloom. The owner of the fishing boat, leered from his wharf shanty by the sounds of the car's approach, stopped abruptly in the lighted doorway and gaped as if seeing a ghost. Kane said huskily, I hope to God you got a drink around somewhere. I need one. My brand is scotch, but anything you got will do. When he climbed the Concord's ladder and descended into the ship's salon some ten minutes later, he felt better. The owner of the boat had possessed a pint of amber-hued liquid that smelled like the concentrated juice of crushed bedbugs and tasted worse than it smelled. Even that, however, felt better than the ether fumes which had worried the cane's stomach for the past many hours. He walked crookedly across the salon and was oblivious to the amazed stares of Moroni, of Mr. Michael Aloysius Kelly, and of others who were assembled there. He looked worse than he felt. One side of his face was swathed in bandages, and his greenish hat was cocked at a grotesque angle because of the strips of adhesive that humped his forehead. Moroni, recovering from the shop, gasped out. Where the hell did you come from? Kane made a face and sat down. I guess you heard what happened? Yeah, sure. Some guy beat you up with a flashlight. We got the light, right here. Found it in the stateroom, but how? Kane stood up stiffly and walked to the news counter, peered down at the searchlight. Any fingerprints on this, he demanded? That guy must have worn gloves, Moroni said. Kane stared around him, encountered the gaping stare of Kelly's big eyes, and saw a thin, hawk-faced woman talking to one of Moroni's men on the other side of the room. The woman was Mrs. Clarence Waite. Kane hooked his mouth into a puzzled frown and took a long look before turning his attention elsewhere. He wondered how it was that some women, after nagging their husbands all through life, suddenly took a large interest in them after death. He poked a cigarette into his mouth and sat down. To Moroni, he said suddenly, Has Ackerman been around? Thank God, no. He gave me enough creeps yesterday. The Moroni jaw muscles tightened honestly. Whatever Ackerman does from now on, I'll know about it. I put a man to keep tabs on him. When? Last night. Last night, Kane said. The good Dr. Ackerman was, he stopped talk, peered across the room at the approaching figure of Frank D.C. D.C. had come from the dining room, was staring at Kane in open mouth astonishment as he paced forward. 
Last night Ackerman was what? Maroney demanded. Skip it, Kane said. I want to look at that stateroom upstairs. He put his feet under him and stood up. Frank D.C., gaping at him, exclaimed loudly, Good Lord, Mr. Kane, what are you doing here? Kelly told me you were at the Peter Bent Brigham. They serve lousy liquor in the hospital, Kane said, and they're stingy as hell with it. I didn't like the joint. He strode across the salon and went upstairs, felt wobbly in his legs as he prowled along the upstairs passageway and pushed open the same door that had opened in his face the night before. Before entering the stateroom, he shot a quick glance both ways along the corridor. Inside, he closed the door behind him, pulled a flashlight from his pocket, and looked around. The room contained nothing worth looking at. He strode to the shuttered window and peered out. A moment later, he was on the catwalk outside, leaning over the ship's rail. The sea was an undulating carpet far below. The light in the wharf shanty on shore was a long way off. Scowling came, went back downstairs, knew before he reached the foot of the big staircase that something had happened during his absence. Maroney was hiking the floor, chewing savagely on a sodden stump of black cigar. He looked up and glared as Kane approached. I just had a phone call, he said thickly, from Mo Finch at headquarters. It seems Finch had a hurry call from some girl who works for Coastal Steamship. The girl was one of Clarence White's secretary. This has possibilities, Kane murmured. Maroney evidently thought so. This girl's been out of town on vacation, see? Just this afternoon she got back to the city and heard about Wade's death. So she calls up police headquarters and says she know where there's some very important information to be had. Maroney spat cigar smoke out of a twisted mouth. So, Mo Finch, being too busy betting on the ponies or something, tells her to come down and tell me all about it. Then he calls me up and tells me to hang around till she gets here. Obviously, Maroney did not relish the idea of hanging around. Neither did Peter Kane. Kane murmured softly. So she works in Waite's office, and she knows something, does she? Rocking around, he hiked towards the stairs. Maroney said, hey, what's the idea? Where are you going? Only a dumb dick like you, Kane grunted. What do you even think of hanging around here after getting a phone call like that? It was after 8 o'clock when he got to Boston, and later than that, when he parked his car on Atlantic Avenue in front of the Coastal Steamship Building. He used up half an hour in rounding up a sleepy-eyed ja night janitor and convincing the man that Peter Kane, being currently in the employ of Coastal, had a right to be let into the Coastal offices. The janitor, after much deliberation, turned on some lights, reluctantly manned an elevator, and ushered Kane into the very dark and very gloomy rooms on the building's fourth floor. Kane went straight to the private office of Mr. Clarence Waite, but he had a feeling... He would be too late getting there. He was. With a hand on the light switch, inside the door he gaped at the scene of upheaval before him. The carpeted floor was strewn with papers. The contents of desk drawers and filing cabinets had been dumped out, pawed through, and flung aside. Wax records of a dictating machine had been spilled from their containers and smashed into chunks of black, gleaming stuff that crunched under Kane's feet as he advanced. He turned a slow circle, stared around him. Half an hour later, when he paced wearily out of the office, the hangdog look on his face would have soured milk. He had listlessly waited through all the stuff that the intruder before him had condescended to leave behind. He methodically explored Clarence Waite's dominion from end to end. The sullen curve of his mouth was proof enough that he had wasted half an hour of good drinking time. When he left the building, he drove uptown to Limpy's and from there drove to the Black Bay apartment house where Peter Kane's name adorned a brass mailbox. The ache in his battered head had grown to alarming proportions. Letting himself into his three-room apartment on the third floor, he savagely kicked the door shut and paraded into the living room. At 4.30 a.m. the next morning, when the phone rang, Peter Kane was sitting deep in a big easy chair with his stocking feet propped on an end table and a large bottle of Limpy's very bad scotch squatting on the floor beside him. The voice on the phone was vaguely familiar. Mr. Kane, the voice wailed. This is Frank D.C. You've got to come down here. Down where? Kane mumbled. Here, to the Concord. Something frightful has happened. You've got to come, Mr. Kane. Our company hired you. Kane made loud, grumbling noises and asked questions, hung up when he realized that Frank D.C. was too excited to supply coherent answers. Something undoubtedly had happened. It was essential that Mr. Kane rush at once to the scene of the happening. If ever there's a lousy job around, Kane groaned, 
I'm elected. It occurred to him later as he sat behind the wheel of the car that after all he might as well be glad of a chance to get the job over with. During the past few hours, the cane thinking apparatus had spawned several loose ends of ideas that were beginning to blend together. He had to get the owner of the fishing boat out of bed, had to bang on the shanty door and bellow loudly before a light went on in the shack and the fellow appeared. At the steamer's hulk, other lights were visible, and between steamer and wharf lay an expanse of bulging ocean that looked dark and mean. You wouldn't have any more of that brimstone-branded brew of yours around, would you? Kane asked. Sure as hell I'll be sick as a goat without some little thing to bolster me up. The fellow had some, but despite the liquor's potency it was seasickness, not the pale contents of the ship that caused Kane to stagger drunkenly when he entered the ship's salon some ten minutes later. The salon was empty. From the direction of the dining room came a murmur of voices that dragged Kane to a halt, made him stop and peer around. He went slowly past the foot of the staircase, paced along the passageway. The voices emanated from a stateroom set back in a small side passage off the end of the dining hall. Maroney was doing most of the talking. Kane, pushed over the threshold, stood staring. It was a big stateroom and had a pair of iron beds instead of a bunk. Maroney, in the middle of the floor between the beds, had his hands hipped and his legs spread wide. It was glaring into the dark, unlovely face of Dr. Nicholas Ackerman. Michael Aloysius Kelly stood with his back against the wall, his big eyes bulging, his face for once empty of the corncob pipe. Frank Deasy was methodically rummaging through a small overnight case that lay opened on a chair. Well, for goodness sakes, Kane croaked. The occupants of the room turned toward him and Maroney grunted disdainfully. Oh, it's you. Frank Deasy had a sheepish look on his face as he straightened above the overnight case and came forward. I guess I should have waited a while before I called you, Mr. Kane, he said. There really was no need for you to come down here. Thanks, Kane said. Slowly he paced toward the cot on the far side of the room, stood there, and peered down. Part 4. Death and a Dumb Waiter The girl who lay there had a crumpled blue dress on, and the dress was soiled and wet-looking. The girl was young. She lay with one leg bent at the knee, and the fingers of one hand pressed rigidly into her stomach. Her face was gray and dirty, and her hair was a stringy mop that bulged out over the pillow. From the looks of things, she had been dead some time. Where, Kane demanded in a low voice, did this come from? No one was in a hurry to answer him. Michael Kelly was gawking. Maroney had jerked his large head in Kane's direction, but was still standing over the stiff, chalk-faced form of Nicholas Ackerman, who sat like a propped-up wax figure on the other cot. Frank Deasy said slowly, Kelly was the one who found her. He was making his rounds, and when he entered this room, he heard a kind of creaking noise that seemed to come from over there. He aimed an unsteady hand at the corner of the room, where a door hung open. The noise came from behind that door, but he couldn't get the door open, so he went and got help. Kane said softly, the door was locked? No, it wasn't. It was stuck. Mr. Moroni and I got it open and found her. Kane strode forward and would have hiked over the threshold. He stopped just in time, used a searchlight from his pocket, and screwed his face into a puzzled frown. It was a queer layout. The enclosure beyond the threshold was a small sized closet of some kind, but the closet had no floor. When the company bought the ship, DC said, the dining hall was half again as big as it is now, and these staterooms didn't exist. Apparently, this was a dumbwaiter leading down to the kitchen. When the staterooms were built, the dumbwaiter was blocked up with a false door. Kane leaned forward, peered down to the depth, and heard a gurgle of water down below. You found the girl in here? Yes. She was wedged in the shaft. The creaking noise Kelly heard was caused by the pressure of her body against the walls every time the ship rolled. Maroney said grimly from the other side of the room, The idea is the girl was a passenger on the night of the crash. She got panicky and made a dive for the door. The door was supposed to be locked, but it wasn't, or else the dock was so damn ancient that she had strength enough to get it open. She thought she was getting into a quarter or something, and instead of that, she took a nosedive down the dumbwaiter and got jammed tight. And she's been there ever since. That's a Moroni's what DC thinks, anyway. Kane peered at the overnight bag. Where did that come from? We found that down in the shaft with her, Moroni shrugged. DC thinks she snatched it up and she made the break. Maybe DC is right about the whole business. Me? I think different. And just why do you think different? Moroni scowled, jerked his head towards the girl's body. 
It so happens, Kane, that this girl's name is Helen Tilson. It also happens that she's the dame who was supposed to come to me a long time ago with some important information. About two minutes after you barged out of here, the gal called up and said she'd be late. Said she was going to the steamship office first to get the papers that contained that important information. Well, here she is. Maroney had his theories but was not sure of them. He went into doubtful detail. Maybe, he said, the phone calls to Mo Finch and me were just gags. Maybe the gal who did the phoning had a good reason for using this girl's name. It's possible, all right, that this dame was a passenger the night of the crash. Sure as hell, this corpse could have been jammed down that dumbwaiter for a couple of centuries without ever being discovered except by accident. Moroni screwed his face around to glare into the great features of Dr. Nicholas Ackerman. But it also happens that I found this mug snooping around here about an hour ago. So help me, he says, he was taking pictures. Moroni had evidently worked long and hard on the good doctor. Ackerman showed pathetic signs of having me subjected to the usual Moroni method of third degree. I I was taking pictures, he insisted. Kane took a long drink from the pint bottle of the vile smelling liquor he had acquired from the owner of the fishing boat. He felt wobbly from being so long in a stuffy stateroom. It's all the same to you people, he mumbled. I'll go take a walk. He closed the stateroom door behind him and was scowling as he paraded across the dining hall and went out on deck. The cane brain had begun to do a great amount of deep thinking. Half an hour or so later, when Moroni and the others appeared, Peter Kane was apparently plastered and his eyes had taken on a sickly green hue from peering so long at so much ocean. Moroni had a look of triumph on his face and a firm grip on the arm of Dr. Nicholas Ackerman. The expression on the face of Mr. Michael Kelly, who shuffled along in the rear of the procession, was strangely enigmatic. The Kelly mouth seemed to bear a slight suggestion of triumph, too. Moroni said, that's where you're going, Ackerman. Right straight to headquarters until you come clean. I got this thing all figured out, and it ain't often I figured things out wrong. He shoved Ackerman to the rail and yelled down to the admiral of the fishing boat. To Kane, he said, hang on to this mug a minute. Positively, Kane gurgled. Kane was plastered, and he released his grip on the rail and turned around. His feet crossed, and he went off balance. The deck was slippery with spray. Less than three paces distant, the railing had a break in it where the ladder hung over the ship's side. Kane pawed empty air and let out a yell. His big body teetered, went out on one foot, and hung over vacant space. Moroni stabbed a hand at Kane's legs, missed. Frank D.C. yelled incoherent words. Kane went overboard. He struck with a huge splash, went down a long way into undulating wet darkness, and made blubbering sounds when he broke surface. A searchlight gleam, yellow on deck, and the beam picked him out, clung to him as he dog-paddled frantically to stay afloat. From the look of things, he either couldn't swim or was too drunk to remember how. He was blubbering under a second time when a hurtling shape shot head foremost from the steamer's deck and sliced the water beside him. The hurtling shape with Frank D.C. D.C. could swim. With a minimum of effort, he dragged Kane up from under, lugged him to the ladder. Moroni and Michael Kelly hauled Kane to the deck. Moroni growled, well, of all the drunken, soft-brained idiots, you're it. Frank D.C. came up the ladder, hand over hand, and spout out a mouthful of seawater. Kane stood up. Thanks, D.C., he said. Oddly enough, he did not look half as plastered as before. His eyes were narrowed, and there was nothing fuzzy about the metallic rasp of his voice. Thanks, D.C., that's all I needed to know. Roni gaped at him, and D.C. took a step backward, staring, and said, What? It was either you or Ackerman. Kane murmured. He took a police thirty-eight from a pocket of his drenched coat and toyed with it. The gun dripped water, but the chances were ten to one it would work if called upon. D.C. made large eyes at it and stood stiff as wood. At first, Kane said, I figured it was Ackerman. I figured he and Mrs. Clarence Waite were in cahoots, an engineered Waite's murder between them. That was before the girl called Mo Finch and said she worked for Waite and knew where to put her hands on some important information. Kane was drunk enough to be enjoying himself. The scared look on D.C.'s face amused him, brought a twisted grin to his lips. I guess you got into a jam with the finances or something, huh? He gurgled. Why not come clean? Moroni said frowning. For God's sakes, Kane, what's eating you? Do you go nuts like this all the time? This mug murdered Waite. Because Waite knew things, Kane shrugged. 
He'll tell us all about it in a minute. Just stick around. He murdered Wade and figured to do it in a way that would leave him a loophole in case things got hot. You can't burn a man for murder unless you first prove the victim was murdered. The poison on Wade's stomach didn't mean a thing. The guy might have been drinking poisoned liquor the night this barge cracked up. The fireworks began when this Helen Tilson girl, or whatever her name is, came back to town and called Mo Finch. Maybe you don't remember it, but DC here was in the salon when you were blabbing to me about getting a call from Mo, and you weren't talking in a whisper. I guess DC was still there when the girl called you and said she was going to the steamship office. Chances are you even told them all about it. Sure I did, Moroni growled. Why wouldn't I? Sure you did. So DC faded out of here and got to the steamship office ahead of me and got his paws on the girl and went through the joint with a cootie comb. I bet you never even knew he'd left the ship. Moroni put his thick fingers into his hair and scratched. He seemed to be remembering things that heretofore had seemed unimportant. Kane said, Until I took a look around Waite's private office, I was on the wrong track. I figured on Ackerman and Waite's wife being in on some dirty scheme that spelled murder. But there were some funny things done in that office. For one thing, a whole bunch of dictating machine records were smashed. The cane orbs drilled holes in DC's white face. Only a guy who works pretty close to Waite, he said, would even figure to suspect that Waite might have put that important information on the dictating machine. I guess you'd better come clean. Frank DC's nerves were in good shape. Despite the lack of blood in his stiff face, he forced a sickly grin to his mouth. You're altogether wrong, Mr. Kane, he said. I assure you. There was another thing had to be figured out, Kane mused. The mug who murdered Waite, Miss Tilson, had to be a good swimmer. He couldn't have lugged those bodies aboard by boat, because the risk was too big, so he had to be a guy with enough swimming ability to tote them through the water. I figured on finding out if he could swim well enough to tote a dead man through the ocean, D.C. Moroni jerked a step forward stood glaring. He was no longer interested in Dr. Nicholas Ackerman. So you weren't plastered when you went overboard? You can swim? I can, Kane caught his answer. Changed it quickly. I can swim like a hunk of lead pipe, mister. It was a chance I had to take. The gun in his fist drooped a little as he swung again on DC. How about coming clean, Mug? DC went lip, had a look of resignation in his face. He had an eye on the opening in the rail with the ship's ladder hung over the side. He shrugged his shoulders. Did you get the important information, or is it still in the steamship offices somewhere, Kane demanded. It, it's still there, D.C. mumbled. A glint of black hate gleamed in his eyes. I couldn't find it. Only for that, I'd have a chance to get out of this. Damn you. Tell us about it. You know about it already. D.C.'s voice drooped low, becoming a mumble. I was in deep. I, well... I stole enough to send me to prison for a long time. I'd been playing the horses. Put a trembling hand to his face and wiped away beads of perspiration. Wait was preparing a report for the auditors, he groaned. And he found out what I'd done. I, well, I had to shut him up. I despised him anyway. And being a bright young man, Kane grunted, you figured to plant the body on board ship where it would look like Wait had been a passenger the night of the crash? What's the rest of it? You know the rest, D.C. mumbled. When Helen Tilson called up, I realized that Wait must have made some kind of report before I killed him. I had to get to the office before she did. I I guess I should have hidden there and waited for her to find the papers, but I was nervous. When she showed up, I... He shuddered, stared helplessly at Crane. Then I got her into my car and drove down here and dumped the body into the dumbwaiter shaft. The overnight case didn't belong to Helen was something I found in one of the other staterooms the day after the crash. You're not so dumb, Kane muttered. I didn't think the body would be discovered so soon, DC moaned. When Kelly stumbled on it, I had to think fast. That's why I called you. I, well, I thought it would clear me of suspicion and you'd be so drunk you wouldn't guess the truth anyway. And DC's voice ended in a sucking intake of breath as he lunged forward. The distance of the rail was about eight feet. He took it in a headlong rush, cleared the opening with inches to spare, and streaked down into darkness. The guttural drone of his voice was still alive on deck when the heaving black waters of the Atlantic sucked him under. Moroni and Ackerman and Michael Kelly stood gaping. Peter Kane plowed forward, stood in the open space above the ship's ladder, and peered down at the widening rings of black water below. 
The sight of so much water brought a pained look to Kane's face. He pulled a pint bottle from his pocket, dropped it, and growled to Maloney. Take care of that. I'll need it. His big body shot out and down, sliced the water, and reappeared almost instantly. A stream of gurgling white foam trailed out behind him as he surged away from the ship. Maroney gasping said in a hoarse voice, For God's sake! Frank D.C. could swim, but the torpedo-like shake behind him caught up with him. D.C. twisted around, put both hands out of the water, and raked savagely at Kane's face, battered wildly as Kane closed in. Terror made a contorted mask of his face and sucked the lurid shriek from his lips. Kane growled savagely, I owe you this one, Mug, and drove a sledgehammer fist into the killer's screaming mouth. The fist crunched home, brought a sobbing sound from D.C.'s throat. Rashing wildly, he flung himself back, spun in the water and again headed for the distant light in the wharf shanty on shore. He turned when Kane's big body again bore down on him. The surface in front of Kane was suddenly a boiling upheaval. D.C. shot down, vanished. Savage hands clawed at Kane's legs, dragged them under. Water rushed into Kane's breath-sucking mouth. Twisting at the hips, Kane hooked himself double and got both hands on the shape beneath him. He was sore and the seawater in the pit of his stomach was making him sick. The fingers of his left hand torn to a mass of wet hair. His right hand balled into a fist stuck three times with tripper hammer precision underwater. Bubbles of blood gurgled to the surface. After that, Peter Kane hooked one arm in a stranglehold around the limp neck of the assailant and swam wearily back to the steamer. Maroney and Michael Kelly helped him haul DC's unconscious form up the ladder. He figured, Kay mumbled, I couldn't swim. Tis, tis, I was a Boy Scout once. Maroney and Kelly gaped at him. Walking crookedly around DC's crumpled body, Kane gathered up the pint bottle and stood swaying. His face in the broad beam of Maroney's searchlight was the color of seaweed. About one half the Atlantic Ocean be grown is inside my stomach. In a couple of minutes, I'm going to be sick. Awful sick. He glared at Maroney, pulled the cork from the bottle and gurgled until the container was empty. When I come to, he said thickly, the first guy that hands me a drink of water, any kind of water, will get. His legs buckled under him, let him down. A groan of torment mumbled up with the heaving content of Kane's stomach. We'll get hell, Kane finished. It ain't my brand.